Welcome to another edition of Clock End Talk Podcast. Is that right? <laughs> I always feel when I say that, I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> I want to say Clock End underscore Talk, but that's not the name of the podcast, is it? That's where, that's where everyone can get us from. Um, uh, as usual, uh, I'm joined this week by Tony. Hello, mate. All right, how you doing? I'm fantastic, ready for a big argument with you. Let's try and get this done in uh, in less than two and a half hours this week. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have two and a half hours of mis- misery. No one will listen to us. <laughs> I've got somebody new on the pod this week. So uh, uh, hopefully, because if Schwinn's um, useless at getting on, Tez obviously is recovering. So this week, uh, we've got a guy who, who uh, does the ratings for us normally at Clock End Talk, and that is Liam. Welcome, Liam. Hi, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, good. So, uh, what? How comes you're an Arsenal fan? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Why, where, where's your love affair with Arsenal start? To try and cut a long story short, um, I've got family. My mum's side are West Ham fans. My dad's side are Arsenal fans. Um, Arsenal played West Ham one day. I decided as I was getting into football, whoever won the game is the team I to pull. Lo and behold, Arsenal won for my many sins, and there you go. That's got to be better than being a West Ham fan, though, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I yeah, mean, come on, our life is pretty terrible at the moment, but you imagine being a, a West Ham fan. <laughs> no, nah, we've only been terrible for 18 months, haven't we, I suppose, whereas West Ham have been terrible since I don't even know when. Yeah, since, I, as, since as long as I can remember. Uh, Tony, you were at the game yesterday, I guess? I saw you there. You know I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right, I picked up my Everton tickets from you. Oh, come on, it's been a long time and I'm getting old. But uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was a, well, <laughs> where should we start with this one? Um, should we go with the usual stuff? Let's, uh, let's try and keep this quick. We, uh, we saw the, uh, the, the, the team announced and uh, there's two enforced changes. So Kolasinac comes in for Tierney, Gendouzi or Gwendouzi comes in for Xhaka, who was um, who had concussion? I understand, so he wasn't available. So that left us with uh, sort of the same sort of setup as we had against West Ham: four across the back, Maitland Niles on the right, Kalasenac on the uh, on the left, Socrates and Chambers as, as uh, the two centre backs, Guendouzi and Torreira as a sort of two man pivot with three in front of them, Urzu in the sort of number ten role with Pepe one side, Martinelli the other, and Aubameyang on his own up front. Tony, are you happy with that? Uh, it's exactly what I would have picked with the players available. I think having seen the game, I would have managed it a bit differently. But in terms of the eleven names on the paper, I said before the lineup in the in the group, like before the lineup was released, sorry, in the group chat, that I, I didn't really see too much else that he could have done, to be honest. No, and Liam, I, I know you you don't like it, do you? Reading your uh, your comments today. Well, the two, the, well, the problem that I had with it was the. Torreira Guendouzi double pivot um, in the middle. I've never been a big fan of it. I said in the group chat as much. It just doesn't work. Um, Torreira is the guy that goes and presses higher up the pitch uh, through instruction or otherwise. So he needs that shackered sort of person that sits a bit deeper. But Guendouzi just doesn't have that defensive awareness. I, I didn't really like it. I thought probably could have done something else with it. Well, that, well, that's the thing, though. As Tony says, I mean, who are the options? There's no Xhaka. Uh, we look. I noticed in your comments you said was out of form anyway. Um, so so uh, Smith Rowe. I mean, who are you going to play uh, against the, the champions of the Premier League? Um, you, you can't. You know, do you want to throw in a kid? You know, we haven't got uh, we haven't got any of those old players left in there. I can't even think of their names. Who's like, who, who was the guy we had for years that hardly ever played? Um, uh, it's got rid of him in the summer. All of those, all of those bit part players that we used to have in the central midfield are all, have all left. So who do you play instead of of, of Guendouzi? It probably wouldn't be the most popular option ever, but my my best guess was probably David Luiz. I know we're not fans of him at centre half, but he did okay against Frankfurt before he went off with his head injury. I couldn't I agree more. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I thought that was that was Emery's Emery it was his last game in Charles, wasn't it? And he suddenly found where we can play Louise. And I want to play him and Gwendouzi together because that'll fuck everybody up. Nobody will know which is which. <laughs> I can, honestly, it's a fair point. <laughs> it'd be exciting. Uh, we went into that game yesterday though with a little bit of hope, didn't we? We were all quite excited after those three points against West Ham. This was, uh, I mean, I don't know how much confidence we had that we were going to win, but Tony, I think we went in there. 
I was in a pub for a couple of hours before the game, which is why I can't remember meeting you yesterday. <laughs> but uh, everyone was was upbeat. We went in there with with some excitement. Didn't you feel that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, as, if it was because of that last half hour or so against West Ham. As, as you said, I don't think people going in thinking, oh, we're definitely going to win today. But we felt like we had a chance and win the game. They're a little bit weakened compared to what they usually are. And and we thought like felt like we had a chance, um, which has not been the case in recent weeks. In recent weeks, we've gone to be playing Brighton at home and Southampton at home and feeling like it's a bit of a 50-50 game. This week, we we probably felt the same, but it was against obviously a much higher calibre of team where usually a City isn't a 50-50. So there, there was that bit of, I don't know if optimism is the right word, but I don't know, enjoyment? I don't know what it was, but there was something in the air. It was the air of despair had disappeared. That's what I felt. I felt yeah, that... yeah that's, that's the best way to put it. It's not like we were sitting there thinking we're definitely going to win. We just wasn't all as doom and gloom as we have been in the last few weeks. And and that, that excitement and air of uh, expectancy lasted for all of about 80 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Then it all came crashing down. I mean, let's go through the game, uh, um, uh, Liam. I guess you watched the game on the, on television yesterday. Um, yeah. We, we've, we've started really brightly. <laughs> Martinelli gets through, works his way almost into a one-on-one situation with a goalkeeper. And uh, their goalkeeper, his, uh, his, his country compatriot, makes a good save. A little bit of a panicked finish, I thought. Um, and, and we're all quite expectant at that, part, at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, I never expected him to go on and score. You'd probably expect Edison to go and save it. It, it was a pretty narrow angle, especially from the TV angle, at least. Um, but, I mean, I was optimistic of a performance more than I was a result. But all of a sudden, I felt, hold on a second, we can cause these guys a few problems. We might not be able to defend well against them, but at least it'll be a bit of a goal fest and uh, we'll get our fair share at the same time. Um, United uh, had beaten them at their place last week. They look fallible, don't they? They're well off the title challenge. They're looking sort of over their shoulder. But there's so much quality in their side. And Tony, I mean, that was it. Two minutes in. Uh, talk me through it. We, we just can't defend. And it's not only the defenders to blame. Aubameyang let Fernandinho go. And I was saying to, to the guy I was sitting with at the game that you've got to realise who you're dealing with. Fernandinho is a career centre midfielder, one that very rarely loses the ball. So there's some centre-backs you can afford to let them go and sort of roam forward. Say Socrates is one of them. You know he's not going to thread an eye of of the needle ball. Fernandinho has made a career doing that. So if you're going to let one of the centre-backs bring it out, let it be Otamendi. So Bamiyang's got a press there. Pepe's caught in two minds. He doesn't know whether to track Mendy or, or go to the ball. In reality, he should leave Mendy free because they shouldn't be beating us in the air. So let, let it go wide and regroup. Chambers, I don't know what the fuck he was doing. He's got the turning circle of an attractor. And the, the ball's cut back and De Bruyne, I mean, the finish is unreal. But it was just a comedy of errors. And, and for that to happen inside the first two minutes when you've already had a really good chance yourself, it's, it's, it's just embarrassing. Like, And I can't... It's a whole team effort. As I said, you can pick on these individual players, but we we seem to be picking on different individual players every week. So you just got to go down. It is a whole team. Don't know how to defend. The system's wrong. It's been wrong for a long time, and and it needs sorting. Did you, didn't you find? I mean, look, I I couldn't rarely I agree with everything you said there. It's a perfect um, summation of of what went on in that goal. And everyone, you're right. Abamyang should have been pressing on the right player Pepe does a little dance and gets beaten very easily uh, it, it is all so simple but that ball comes across to Kevin De Bruyne and that's where I am in the ground and I thought he'd miss it off his shin when I saw it live because that ball rocketed so quickly into the top corner it was unbelievable and you sort of think I thought it'd come off his shin just because he hit it so hard and it could have gone anywhere. But where does it go? It goes right in the top corner. I mean, he's brilliant, isn't he? He uh, is. I'm really, for me, he's the best player in the league. Like, I always, I used to say Hazard was the best player in the league. And he might not have got the numbers that the other guys do. But in terms of technical, good, gifted player, um, I, I always thought it's Hazard. Obviously, he's gone now. And I think De Bruyne is the best player in the league. The, the thing, I mean, you say, like, how hard he kicked it. He, he seems to hit a ball. And you usually get players either can place the ball really well or hit a ball a million miles an hour, but it could go absolutely anywhere. 
he seems to be able to do both. Like he kicks the ball really hard, and it always seems to go in the corner. He's he's got everything. He is such a good player. But I mean, if you're going to give him the freedom of North London, he is going to cause that sort of damage. Yeah, I mean, he was just on fire yesterday, wasn't he? And then 15 minutes in, Liam, um, it's all Kevin De Bruyne again. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the goal now from the top of my head. It's, um, uh, it's, I mean, it was one of those, it was just him. He he, he does a one-two just inside our half. Um, he turns, Gendouzi's caught the wrong side of him. So he just breezes past Gendouzi. And then before anyone's even thought about trying to stop him, he, he puts one in the top corner. Um, it's it's just, is that, is that fair? Have I got the right goal there, Tony? <laughs> no. No, it's Sterling's got the second goal. Sterling. Oh, OK. Oh, well, that's the cutback. Yeah, I'm talking about the third goal, aren't yeah. I? I've already gone on to, to the third goal. <laughs> the I third haven't goal, went, bottom, the third oh, goal right. went bottom corner. Sorry? The third goal went bottom corner, not Yeah, that's, that's the one. Yeah, so I'm, I'm already on to the third one. Do you know, when it went 2-0 down, so what was the second goal, Tony? Help me out. Uh, he, did, he played a 1-2, got in down the left, crossed it, and it deflected. Kolasinac <sighs> was sort of on his heels. Um, because of the deflection on the cross and Sterling tapped it in from about two yards. Yeah, I can see it now. In my notes, I've got lucky. I mean, uh, isn't that it? We're, we're a few minutes in, 15 minutes in, and everything. I mean, it's so easy, isn't it? It's so easy. They get the byline, put it back. But even that slight deflection takes it right into Sterling's path. Whereas if it wasn't deflected, it, it just gets cleared easily. <laughs> we're just unlucky, are we? Is it? Are we in that? Are we in that? Again, though. Are we in that period where. You know where everything is goes when you when nothing goes right for you, everything goes wrong. Yeah, but you make your own luck, and like this, the difference. And everyone at the ground was moaning about it yesterday, so so Darren will know what I'm talking about. Torreira slides in on De Bruyne when he makes that one-two, and and the ball gets away, and they make that one-two, and De Bruyne gets to the touchline. One million percent. If Torreira was any City player there, De Bruyne is getting fouled. Like it's just. You do you make your own luck and look that cross is lucky that it deflects and goes straight into Sterling's path. But Man City don't concede that goal. No, no you're right. I mean, Liam, did they say on the television at all about the tactical fouling of City? I mean, Lundberg mentioned it in his press conference, and as Tony says, that's all we could talk about. You know, the, the I, I talked last Sorry, week. Sorry, uh, Olympiakos. We've got in the Europa League. Oh, have we? Oh, yeah. well, that's not a bad draw. No, away first. That's about as good as it could have got. You heard it here live first, but this isn't live. So by the time this goes out, everybody else would have known about it. We'll talk about it afterwards then. So, um, we, you know, I talked last week about not having any physical players who, who protect our players and not having those nasty players. Is it just really that we don't, Liam, we just don't have any intelligent players because they tactically fouled us all the game yesterday. I mean, they've got five players booked and we just let them run through us, Liam. Did they mention that on the box yesterday? <laughs> Uh, if they did, it was in Dutch and I didn't understand it. Uh, I live in the Netherlands, so there's only so much I can pick up. Um, I think they mentioned it a couple of times after the game because they, they showed a few replays of uh, little niggly things that they did. And I think Lundberg, it, it was sort of insinuating Lundberg was talking to Pep about it after the game. But it, you're absolutely right. It wound me up all game. And Gwendouzi, I thought, was the most culpable of all of them because... The, the guy's great. He's got great ability. He's got great drive. And he's got determination about him. But other than that, he doesn't really offer a lot, especially going defensively. And it wound me up all game. The, Pepe doesn't do it when he presses Fernandinho. Um, Aubameyang didn't do it all game. None of our defenders want to go and engage the ball, which is part of the problem as well. It happens all the time. It, it, it's not just today. It's every single week, to be honest. And it just it's frustrating. I see, um, I don't know how it was we ran you, Tony. When we went 2-0 down, I mentioned these three blokes who sit in front of me or a bloke and his two kids who sit in front of me every week who are just the most miserable people I've ever, you know, this bloke is bringing up his two kids to just hate. And uh, the second goal went in, in what, eight, 15 minutes, something like that, and they left and they never came back. Was was there anyone as, as like that around you? Uh, I'm not sure about the second. There was loads at the third. Genuinely, at half time, skipping ahead a bit, there was cues to get out. Like it was, I, I and I, I saw someone wait <laughs> because there was cues to get out. So he wait, got a drink, and then when the cues died down, left. <laughs> like there, there was genuinely like it's been f- pictured on Twitter, and there's a little video on Twitter, and people going, "Oh, it must have been one off." There was three people at one turnstile, so it was a bit slow. I mean, we'll get on to this at the end because there is there is something that sort of happened in that uh, migration away from the ground is that we were sort of left with what I would call your proper 
football supporters. Um, I'm very critical of Arsenal fans these days, um, both the ones on social media and the ones in the ground. But it was a kind of weird thing. We're 3-0 down and this is a time when we sort of want to get behind our players and and most of the people who, who haven't got that sort of mindset left. And it left us with, you know, a half-empty stadium, but of people that were singing and quiet behind the side. Wouldn't you say that was right, Tone? Yeah, I mean, you always know we're utter shit when we love you, Arsenal. Starts getting belted <laughs> around. It, it's just like a sign of defiance when we're about 8 nil down in the game. We're doing absolutely nothing in. Like, it, nothing's ever as bleak as when we sing we love you, Arsenal. Yeah. And then the only other point of interest, I think, in that first half was um, just before half-time, the most incredible save from our goalkeeper. Liam? Save of the season, without a doubt, already. Must be, surely. Yeah. It, I mean, he's at full stretch to try just to get something on it and he gets just enough of his fingertips on it just just tip it onto the post. It was... He doesn't have a lot of time to react because as uh, I think it was Tony just said a moment ago, he has this knack for in it hard but also at the right place. So it's just so difficult for any goalkeeper to stop but for him to react quickly enough, get there and get enough on it to tip it onto the post was unreal. Yeah, I mean, it, it just... I mean, look, 3 nil's bad enough but we would have gone in 4 nil down and... There would have been no one left. <laughs> it would have been embarrassed. Uh, did, did you have a good view of it in the game, Tony? Did I what, sorry? Did you have a good view of, of that save from where you are? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it's one of them. You could see he'd saved it and it, it looked pretty good. And as as I said before, because of how hard the Bruyne kicks the ball, you know they're, they're always going to be half decent. But because I'm towards the back of the lower tier, we've got the screens directly above us. Um, yeah. So I sort of replayed within a few seconds and... and it was better. As I said, I thought it was class anyway. And then when I saw it again, it, it was better than I thought. Anyway, so we're getting to half time. We're three nil down. Half the crowd leaves. Uh, I had a chicken burger at the ground for the first time in 10 years. It's revolting. Don't ever go there again. I, I had one actually. I had one at Man City at home, uh, not last year, the year before. It was just after the Carabao Cup final. Yeah. And it managed to be hot, cold, frozen, and burnt at the same time. <laughs> yeah. It was a phenomenon. Like, you can't believe this product exists. Yeah. I mean, I know, you know, me and you have the pleasure of going to see the Arsenal at the Emirates every week, every other week. And I'm sure that lots of people who listen to this podcast, especially those that aren't based in this country, like Liam, are, are jealous of the fact that we get to go and see them. But sometimes it's a nightmare. And honestly, I very rarely eat or drink in the ground because uh, uh, there's so many good pubs around uh, the stadium. But that was a disgrace. £5.70 for, a, as you say, a dry chicken burger that managed to be frozen and burnt at the same time it's incredible um, I keep hearing about how great Tottenham Stadium is and that's it from the catering point of view there's so much choice now of course Tottenham's in a shithole of an area so they've made their new stadium somewhere where they can get all of their fans to come in for a couple of hours before and make some money it's a very good idea but it looks first class catering and at Arsenal pff, just, it's just disgraceful really Arsenal and Wembley are the same company I don't know who does Tottenham's and it's on them but obviously they pay their fee at the start or I think they got a 10 year contract or whatever it is and and they look to cut costs as much as possible I mean a quarter a quarter pizza is £5.20 and it's the Chicago town pizzas that you can buy for £3 for the whole thing and they're they're charging £20 basically for the for the whole thing yeah, I was uh, I was out on Saturday afternoon for a drink um, in in Stansted with a mate of mine whose son in law is the catering manager for Wembley and was previously at Arsenal, and he's just been promoted. So uh, he he was telling me how proud he was of his son in law. <laughs> uh, my notes for the second half are limited to this: Manchester City kept the ball, <laughs> and that's that's all I've got. Anyone, any anything else from the second half, Liam? That I've missed. It was a, it was a completely dead contest. To be honest, I think the only thing I remember of the half was Chambers deciding to give the ball away right square in front of his own box, uh, and Lena had to get up pretty quickly to. I can't remember who was through on goal, but stop the them scoring a fourth. Other than that, I think I almost fell asleep watching. I was on Twitter more than I was watching the game. It was just completely dead. It was completely dead. Uh, um, I remember that incident. Yeah, that that was a, a second good save I've got down for Leno. Anything I've missed, Tony? I mean, they just gave us a, a real example on on the difference in quality. They just they just kept the ball with so much confidence and so much ease 
that they just made us run about. I mean, uh, we in the last 20, 25 minutes, we'd get the ball for two or three passes and then not have it for four or five minutes. Would that, is, am I remembering it wrongly? No, you, you're you're correct. But I genuinely, well, not I, I think they might have had an agreement that don't embarrass us and we won't try and come back. It looked like they just sort of settled. They weren't trying to score. As you said, they kept the ball without really actually doing anything. We didn't try and get it back off them. When we did get the ball, we kind of just punted it up long or, as you said, had two or three passes and then lost it. I really feel like it was just like, not, they obviously haven't agreed it, but it was sort of, you could see by the way the game was going that we don't push, you don't push, everyone's sort of happy. 3 0 is not ultra embarrassing. They'll take a 3 0 and, and that's it because they could have won that game any, any, any score they wanted, to be honest. Yeah, it's frightening, isn't it? Um, anything, anything else, either of you, that I've I've missed from the game? It, it, I think you know, there's not a lot to talk about. We we weren't really in it, were we? No, not really. I think I said as much in my report. I was struggling to write a report for the second half and included Leno's save in it. Uh, I think I mentioned that the only Arsenal chance of any kind of note in the second half was Aubameyang deciding to put one several yards wide on the half volley on his weak foot from the very far corner of the City penalty box. That was as close as we got. Well, there was the Aubameyang header just just into the second half, about a minute into the second half, but I think that was it. Yeah, I mean, I remember the one that Liam's talking about, thinking yeah. it was it was one of those that it had to be absolutely perfect. It needed Kevin De Bruyne to, to hit it <laughs> to, to make it work, and it wasn't. <laughs> well, I, I guess we should get on... I mean, look, we're, this could be the shortest podcast anyway. There was not many questions today. Oh, did you notice that... What is it? Is everyone just that miserable? I thought there'd be a lot about the new manager. I thought there'd be a lot about all sorts of stuff. But everyone was a little bit, I think, just so down after after the high of, of West Ham. So I suppose we better do our three two ones. Um, I'll start with you, Liam, because you've done your rating, so you should be sort of ready for this. So who's your three points to go to this week? Uh, my three went to Martinelli, um, simply because... I know Tony mentions it every week. You don't want to give it to someone on their work rate and how much, and how work, how hard they work. But I mean, he he does work for the cause. He tracks back and he defends and he does both sides of the game. And we just need more of that in the team. It's what we're missing. So for that, I have to give him the three. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, same. Martinelli, only person that really looked like he cared. Yeah, I'm, I've got my, no change here. I've got Martinelli as well for my three points. For those of you who are listening for the first time, what we're basically doing is uh, the clock end talk, um, uh, predict each week, they, or say their they're best and second and third best players each week, and then we, we tally that up, and at the end of the season, we'll have a clock end talk player of the year. Um, we also have our individual ones as well, so it, which works because I strongly disagreed that Lacazette got it last year, and it may be the case that a clock end talk player of the year might be on the total of all our votes might be someone but then individually we may have someone else right okay all right okay good good i didn't know you were uh, <laughs> do we know if anyone's collating this i saw a message uh, on the group we spoke about it the other day and not really but i think tez said he's gonna go he's got it up until he went to hospital oh, okay um, so, and then i think he's just gonna tally it up since because it's always at the same kind of point in the show so sure. should be able to find it well while you're on tony who's your two points go to leno um, to be honest he didn't actually have too much to do but he's made a world class save couldn't do anything with any of the goals the, the save from Jesus that you was talking about was, I mean I don't think it's a great save he, he saved it that's what he had to do uh, his kicking was a little bit better uh, I'm clutching at straws here I'm, I'm basically giving it for making one good save in the first half Yeah, what about, what about you Liam? Exactly the same I think he wins the two just purely for the sake of De Bruyne that's about it yeah, do you know what? This is this is the strange one because I've also got Leno. I, I thought that save that he made, if that was a striker scoring a goal, it would be being played again and again and again and we'd all be talking about it. So, uh, And we'd probably be giving somebody points just because they scored such a great goal. So, uh, yeah, I've got my two points as well for, for Burnt Leno. Um, more difficult, I think, it gets now. Liam, who's, who's your one point go to? Do I have to give it to someone? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably Torreira to be honest because I think for half an hour he looked like he cared as much as Martinelli did put himself about tried at least I mean beyond that I don't recall him actually doing much in the game but I can't really give it to anyone else I don't think uh, it was a little bit tough after those first two Tony have you got someone that stood out to you 
Oh yeah, I mean we're we're I think we're all in the same boat where I think the three and the two pick themselves. The one you could pick anyone and make up a reason for it and, and half be all right. Uh, I I was thinking Torreira as well just because again he tried, which is not enough. But when it looks like most other people weren't honourable mention to Pepe, not that he played well, but again we went back to our game plan being give him the ball and hope, and it didn't achieve anything. So I can't give him any points, but. When you're hanging him out to dry like that, I would just give him a mention because, as I said, it's another one where Lundberg didn't pick him in his first two teams and then now suddenly it's back to give the ball to him and hope he can do something. It literally baffles me what we're trying to do this season. Yeah. It really- well, like my one point does go to Pepe. I just enjoy watching him play. It's, it's simple as that. It's just simple. When a ball goes to Pepe, you're not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, and that's not always good. But as a as a playing supporter, I, I just want to watch players like that play football. I think it's exciting. And uh, it, 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 if he'd have scored the goal that he scored against West Ham in the first week of the season, this might be a completely different Pepe that we're seeing. But uh, uh, but we didn't. And he didn't. And um, And I just like watching him play unlike some of the others. Anything I've missed from the game, Tony? Anything you can think of that um, that we should have covered? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't know. I've not looked at the questions, but... like, uh, So I'm going to bring it up now, but if it's in the questions, if you've read them, then ignore me. But we have to bring up Gwendouzi refusing to track runners again. It's just becoming comical now. Is there any questions on that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say I've looked at them, and I did, but I've forgotten. Uh, Liam, any any is there questions on Gendouzi? Can you remember? <laughs> uh, not from what I've seen. I've seen one about how much did we miss Shaka, and that might half come into it, if I'm yeah. honest. But um, that's as close to a Gendouzi question as I could find. We'll save it for then, then, because it does come into it. Yeah, I think that's the last question, actually. Um, OK, well, let me uh, get to the... I guess that's it. I mean, if there's nothing... I said before, last week we did two and a half hours because there was so much to talk about. Uh, and, and this week we're 26 minutes in. We've done the game. We've done the formation. We've done our three two ones. Uh, is there any positivity out there? I mean, um, can I say, I thought that in the first half, apart from letting in three goals, we didn't play that badly. I thought Manchester City were just that good. Is that unfair, Tony? Uh, uh... Well, that's the thing. Even at two nil, you're sort of like, if we get a goal because they're so bad at the back, like this game isn't over. Obviously, they're in the driving seat at two nil, but you felt like we could score, and then, and then it was game on because they're as bad at the back as we are. They're just a bit more sensible and keep the ball better. I think yeah. I said as much in the group chat as well. I just said if we get the next goal, there's still a game here. But if they get the third, that'll kill it stone dead. And yeah, that's what happened in the end. Yeah, it very much was that. Um, okay, well, let's just get on to the questions then. Uh, uh, the first one is from Tez. Good old Tez. Um, hopefully, Tez will be back on the podcast next week. I know he's just got a couple of appointments at the moment that he can't miss. So, Tez says, fans will now come out and blame Stan because they don't want to badmouth Freddie, being an ex-player and legend. Freddie has been thrown in at the deep end and told to swim. He's in ex- um, he's inexperienced and he doesn't. He is inexperienced and he doesn't really have a clue. It's a shame because this spell at Arsenal has tarnished his reputation. I mean, Tony, do you agree with what Tez is saying there? Look, I've always said I don't really understand the Cronky abuse. He doesn't know much about football, so he's appointed people who are meant to. And beyond that, he's a stay away owner, but he is just an owner of a business. He's not even a. He's not the chairman. I, I, I really, I don't know actually know what people want from him apart from to sell the club, but when you ask why, it's basically people want investment, they want a sugar daddy, which doesn't really exist anymore. There's like what most clubs now run on a profit. I think it was 18 of the 20 Premier League clubs turned a profit last year. So apart from just wanting him to give us a blank checkbook, which ain't going to happen, I don't really know what people want from him. And and I know people will will tweet in and disagree, but it's never really made sense to me. In terms of the Freddie thing, it's exactly what I said at the start. Giving him, and we had this debate last week, giving him a prolonged period could kill his reputation and, and career going forward. Look, they've hung, they've hung him out to dry because they've, he said it after the game yesterday. His backroom staff, I think they said Emery had something like 12 coaches or people around him. Uh, Lundberg's backroom staff is Mertesacker, who is still managing the academy. And... 
who was it? It was someone else, and it was just someone completely random. It was the like, it was the goalkeeping coach. Yeah. So. <laughs> But well, he's doing a and good it's, job. It's a new keeper. I think it might even be the youth team's keeping coach because obviously Casado was the old one who would have went with Emery because he's his right hand man. Yeah. So they've so, given him nothing. Like yeah. watch Chelsea, and he said after the game he's barely had any training sessions because it's it's sort of game rest, game rest, game rest, travel. But you can't succeed when everyone else is dealing with all these data analysts and they've got twelve to twenty people in their backroom staff. You can't say to him, "Oh, you've got." Mertesacker, who's never been a coach and is doing another job at the same time, and and this keep this guy was going to help your keeper. Like, give. I know I know they didn't want to appoint anyone because if they give him a backroom staff, then they would have to obviously sack them at some point if they get a new manager. But then if that's the case and they knew that, they shouldn't have kept Freddie in charge this long. I was all. If you're going to have him in charge, give him a fighting chance. Like, we don't know how good or how bad he is, but they've just given him nothing. Um, Liam, I I don't know how old you are, how long you've been watching Arsenal. Um, do do you do you remember Freddie Lundberg as a player? Yeah, I'm 22, so I remember a bit of Freddie as a player. I, I sort of came into it just past the Invincibles, so I remember bits of him. I mean, he was a phenomenal player. He looked like he was a smart player as well. So that's where you can sort of see why he might be a good coach as well. But like Tony's saying, he needs to be given the tools and he's saying exactly that to the press and to the board. I think what else can he do? When I ask about how, how you know him, because those who don't know him as a player, I mean, yes, he was an excellent player. I mean, that that goes without saying. But he was also one that the fans related to. I mean, we, we sing the song about him dyeing his hair red for the cup final. You know, players don't do that. He was really in love with the club. He really was um, a, a fans player. We don't get so many of those these days. You know, the, the, the amount of money that's in the game now, there doesn't seem to be any loyalty. But Freddie was one of us. So uh, I guess the reason I'm asking the question, Liam, is that I have a lot of... Cool, I've got a lot in the bank for Freddie Lundberg, a lot. You know, he can do a lot wrong for me before I lose... Um, lose uh, Lose my lose my faith in him as a man because I know he, he's an Arsenal man, but you're a different generation to me watching the game, Liam. Do, do, you know, can he keep on losing, or, or will you t- will you as a fan turn on Freddie, or as your as Tess says, or will you turn on uh, the people above Freddie? No, I wouldn't turn on Freddie, especially not at this point. If I'm honest, um, I, I think for two reasons. One. We all know how much of a legend he is. Whether you watched him play or didn't, you know how much this club means to him. I mean, you can see it on the touchline. He's got his head in in his hands, the way he speaks in the media, and even just knowing what he was like as a player. Like you say, the red hair, we all it's just so famous. Um, But also, I have a great deal of sympathy for him. Like uh, we've already mentioned before, without having the coaches' staff behind him, what is he meant to do? And that does give you a certain degree of sympathy and think, well, OK, maybe you could question his decisions, but he does need that helping hand at the same time. So you've got the fan sentiment and the sympathy going for him at the moment. Yeah, I guess. Um, Halls of Marbles, um, changing the subject. Oh, we want to get on to the manager. We'll get on to Freddie and we'll get on to um, what's going to happen in the club. I, I'm not sure if there's questions specifically about the manager. I'm sure there is. And we'll get on to that then, I guess. Um, let's go, just go through these questions as they came in. This one's from Halls of Marble. We as fans overrate many of our players who never will be good enough. In my humble opinion, says Halls of Marble, Holding, Chambers, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, Socrates, Louise, Kalazanac, Ozil are not currently at the level we need and should all be sold. Why has our recruitment been so dire over the past few years? Tony, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, I disagree on a lot of them. Like, you can say hold him presently, but before he was injured, people were claiming, people were going over the top and claiming how good he was, but there was no question of him being good enough. It was that he definitely was. Socrates last season was definitely seen as good enough. So when you say presently, if you mean in this current reign of form, yeah, but you can't sell everyone, any, everyone every time they have a bad run of form under a very unstable club and management system. Um, look, we pretty much unanimously unanimously as a fan base claimed or decided that we won the transfer window in the summer. So this recruitment thing coming around, our oh, recruitment's terrible. Well, it wasn't, people weren't saying that in August. So we've had a few bad, well, a lot of bad results. And suddenly I think it's just another stick to beat KSE with, uh, with our oh, look, terrible recruitment again. 
hang on, in the summer we spent 150, 160 million. Everyone was claiming we won the transfer window. And and now suddenly it wasn't good enough. Like, you got to make your mind up somewhere along the line. I, I agree, um, Tony. I think you're, you're right. We we were all so happy with getting rid of a lot of dead wood. El Nenny, that's the player I was thinking of earlier. Players like that who, who we moved out of the club. Players that weren't first choice, that were taking decent wages, that didn't really make it. And we got rid of pretty much half of our squad and, and invested in some you know, some good players. And, and now suddenly it's not, not good enough. And um, Liam, on that list of players, you know, Holding, Chambers, Socrates, Maitland, Niles, Louise, Kalazanak, Ozil, they're not all at the, the level we need to be. Any any views on that? I think it depends how you look at it as well. In some cases, because we all, we're, we're sentimental bastards at the end of the day as well, and we all want to like our players and, and we overrate them as a result. But you've also got to look at it as, we can't just have a team of first 11 players and then a youth bench. You need some squad players in there. So the likes of Kolasinac, Maitland-Niles, Chambers are probably quite good squad players. Maybe they're not good enough for the first 11, but they're, they're good squad players. The players that sort of make your bench look a bit stronger. I disagree on a few. Holding, I think, I feel for holding because I think his injuries held him back. He's out again trying to recover and I think that's hampered him in his performances. Maitland Niles, I still don't really know what sort of player he is, but you can see he's got ability. Like Tony said, Socrates was one of the fans' uh, favourite players last season, and all of a sudden he's not good enough because he's in a bad run of form. I mean, we thought he was one of the best players last week against West Ham, same with Chambers. So, one week you're, you're crap because you've had a bad game, the next week um, you're a hero again. Yeah, that's fair comment. Uh, I've got a lot to say on this, but I'm going to hold my water because I'm going to put forward who I should think should be the next manager at the right time and uh, who I think we should sell. Uh, but we'll save that for a little bit. Um, this is also from Halls of Marble. He says, surely KSE must be called out now. I know you've had your reservations on the We Care Do You movement, but we've been experiencing a rot which emerged under the latter Wenger tenure. And KSE... Uh, has permitted to grow and fester. Is there a reason why KSE cannot be responsible? Uh, I'll, I'll take this to you, Tam, but can I just say, I I mean, you said already, Tony, that KSE get this shit. Um, I've, my, my view has always been simple. I've always wanted the owners of our club to be supporters of the club. That's all I've wanted. You know, somebody who cares as much as I do. Uh, and, you know, when a, an American oligarch and business by our business to run as a um, as a non-profit organization you know you're never going to get that love josh at Cronkay at least seems to have a little bit of of, of um uh, he seems to have grown with his love for the club and i've got no issue but i don't see what you think is going to happen you know ksc have made this investment they 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 own our club and you know if we were doing really well there might be an option to sell us but fair, that we're not. We're in free fall. We're going down. Their investment is getting worse and worse. They're not going anywhere. So what do you think we can do as, as fans to change that? There's nothing. Tony, am I wrong? No, as I said, I don't... I, I, look, I, I, I half agree with you in that look, we would all love a, a fan to own the club. But in, in reality, it's not going to happen the way modern football is. You look at, around everyone, you might claim Abramovich has become a fan, but... Again, he definitely wasn't when he took over. The Mansours are just using it to get the Etihad popular, or that, that region of countries. Like, it's that's not the way football is anymore. And as I said, I agree with you in an ideal world, but it, it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. And, and even if it was, I, I won the, the lottery, and, or I'd have to win several lotteries, and, and became the owner tomorrow, what do people want? Like, if, if they're really passionate about the club and sit in the director's box every week but don't open the checkbook which is seemingly what everyone wants does that make them any better than the Cronkies I, I don't I just see a load of people that go ah oh, yeah it's the board's fault or it's the, it's the KSE's fault but I don't actually know what people want barring an open checkbook which just isn't going to happen now, Liam, I mean, are you, we've seen um, Abramovich come in and go, and we've seen the people at Manchester City come in with their, their, their fortunes. I mean, I've always been of the opinion that I like Arsenal to be self-funding, that we we don't have a... There's something better about winning when, when, it's not, when you've just bought your way to the top, which is what Chelsea and Manchester City have done in recent years. 
but you know you're you're of a younger generation to me do you think is that what you would like is that what you would desire somebody to come in with a with with billions and 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 pay our way back to the top well i mean the first thing i want is i support this club because i love it and i want us to win right so how we do that it, it, can we do it through our sustainable methods perhaps i mean leicester won the league and that without spending a lot of money but that was considered a fluke even though they're up there again um I would like to see us spend a bit of money, but at the end, we actually did this summer, and I think it was the first year in, at least in recent memory that I can recall, that KSA actually put their hands in their own pockets, and it didn't come from the sustainable funds idea. I like the idea, but I want Arsenal to win at the end of the day. I don't want us to go bankrupt as a result, but you've got to spend money to make money, haven't you? Yeah, I'm not sure that, you know, we talked about how good the transfer window was, but I'm not sure we actually did spend any money. Um, we sold a lot of players and the big purchase that we made, Pepe, was done in instalments and probably didn't pay anything in the first year. Uh, I'm not sure that we did, you know, our net spend was that great, but it was, I thought, a good transfer window. But um, I, I'm, I'm with Tony all, all day on this. It's always sack the board. Well, you know, they've, they've put some very talented people in place. Um, who are meant to be running our football club. And they got rid of Gazidis, so they can't be all bad. Let's move on a bit. Um, I'll come straight back to you, Liam, on this, because we mentioned this earlier. How much did we miss Xhaka, who was out with concussion, having to play Genduzi Torreira? Um, I saw in your comments, you, you, you're really down on my favourite player, Genduzi or Guendouzi. I think you, you scored him a three out of ten, which um, yeah. I, I, I just really didn't see. So did we miss Xhaka? In the system that we played, yes. Um, I actually really like Chaka. I don't think he's as bad as anyone makes out, but he's a scapegoat for the team when nobody plays well. Um, he's the figurehead for that, so he will always get the criticism. The problem with him is, I like Chaka and Torreira as a double pivot. You've got Chaka who's got the good part; he's got the passing range, and you've got Torreira who's actually quick enough to cover the ground and do the defensive duties. But Jack has actually also improved in recent weeks. And it was actually, I was thinking, oh, for God's sake, why is he injured now when he's actually coming into some good form? Because I knew Grandusi would play as a double pivot and that's not where he's best suited. He's best in a in a three-man midfield. So, yeah, I think we did miss Xhaka in this game because of the formation we put out. But I think you could have coped if you put him in a different system. Do you think, um, Tony, do you think... Somebody who's slow and ponderous as Xhaka in this game would have made any difference? Uh, well, I'd, he doesn't let people walk off him or nowhere near as much as, as Guendouzi does. It's not it's not that Guendouzi gets caught for athleticism, that they're running off him and he just can't catch him. He just doesn't ever follow anyone ever. I mean, the third goal is the best example of it. He's completely the wrong side of De Bruyne. I don't know where he's going. The ball gets rolled in, a two-yard ball, and, and then suddenly De Bruyne is running at our back four because Guendouzi's the complete wrong side of him. The second goal, the same. He goes to press a ball that doesn't need to be pressed. He gets two types of Foden. The ball's knocked inside him and now suddenly they're away and break in and two passes or three passes later they score. Neither He's he's like a dog where he sees a ball and he just runs and there's no rhyme or reason for it. He just runs and then they play a little ball in behind him and he's fucked and he's completely out of the game. Didn't you think, um, you know, you, you've talked uh, in the past about that Xhaka is the most obvious captain on the pitch. Uh, and gendouzi has been, he's a young player who's been with us now for a, a season and a half. Is he someone that we're not able to educate? Or is that just something that's been missing? Is that whoever he's playing alongside, which has normally been Xhaka this season, are not educating him? in the way he has to, to operate as a midfielder. Anyone? Well, I mean, look, if he, he's been letting people run off him for a year and a half and he's never once improved, never shown any signs of, of, of changing it. You can't... In one sense, you can, I, I wouldn't blame another player. I would maybe blame the coaching staff because someone's got to highlight, it, highlight that to him because it, it costs us so many goals. I dare say that he costs us more goals than Xhaka does, but... People won't want to hear that because they love Guendouzi and hate Xhaka and everything Xhaka's fault at all times. Um, but then you also, so you have to blame the coaching staff for, for not highlighting that. But then you also have to have a look at him. He's He has the potential to be a top, top player. But if he doesn't fix that part of the game, he's never going to get to where he wants to or needs to be. So 
you've got to look at self-improvement as well. You can't just expect everyone else to do everything for you at all times. At, at times, you have to look at your own game. You can't tell me that every player that's ever improved anything has, has relied on a coach to do it for them. Um, but but isn't that isn't that one of our fundamental problems? Is our players aren't getting any better? Yeah, you know? but as I said, yeah, that's so I'm partially blaming the coaches, but I also think the players, and it's not only him, but it's just we're speaking about him at the moment. The players have to have a look at themselves as well. Like if you're if you've let one runner go once, okay, it can sort of happen. He's this has been continuous, no matter who he's playing. So you can't just say, "Oh, De Bruyne is a good player; he can run off at anyone." No matter who we're playing, no matter who's directly against him, he's been letting them run off him for a year and a half. That That's more than just looking at Xhaka and blaming him or looking at a coach and blaming him. Yes, all these people are culpable, but the first person, you've got to look at yourself. If you're making that same mistake every week, the person that has to be blamed is the person making it. If if Chambers lost his marker from a court, who he was marking from a corner every week and they scored a header from it or got a header off and it either went in or didn't, people would be absolutely hammering him. You've got to get tighter. You've got to do this. They wouldn't be blaming the coaches or blaming Socrates for not helping him get tighter. But for some reason, Guendouzi's immune from criticism. And I don't understand it. I don't think he's immune from criticism. I'm finding that he, he's starting to really um, be divisive in the Arsenal fan base. A lot of people like you two are, are, are not his biggest fan. I, I think he is getting a lot of criticism. I just think that for somebody who's so young, who's thrown in, you know, last season, um, ahead of Torreira in lots of cases, you know, he's and when we play in three in midfield, he played pretty much every game week in, week out last year. Um, because uh, the coach obviously saw something in him, but he is making these mistakes. I just think that it's, it's there's a danger that because he is not being you know trained well, we hear that Lundberg says he doesn't have any time with the players. Um, you know, it, it, we are just ruining a, a young player. He, he won't want to play for Arsenal soon. Anyway, let's let's just move on with that. MWA Gunner asked that question about Xhaka and he follows up with, what's the number one position we need to address in the transfer window, whether it's in January or the summer? The easy answer is centre-back, but what can they do if the defence isn't organised and drilled enough? Liam, who, uh, where do you think we're, we're missing out? I mean, centre-half, like MWA says, it is the easy position to pick. Potentially central midfield as well. I know we've got an abundance of central midfielders at the moment, but they're not. They don't seem to be specialists in, any, in anything. And Guendouzi is the prime example of that. I would like to see uh, a, a taller Torreira type player, like a Fabinho, who who will marshal the defence and specialises in just giving them a bit of protection. That will help us score, uh, stop conceding a lot of goals. Um, I do feel a little bit for the centre halves as well. I don't think be, I think they're being set up to fail a little bit, not being given any protection. There is also an argument as well. Actually, I think full back we need to strengthen because we've now not got a left back. Um, Bellerin seems a bit injury prone, and we don't have a natural right back uh, to cover Bellerin. So I think there's a case for central midfield and full back. Yeah, and uh, Tony, anything different there or? Uh, it, unless we've got a manager who can sort out a proper system, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> like, my only answer can be manager because with a proper system, you can hide a lot of a lot of negatives. Like, as I said, we, we all agree pretty well. Darren didn't voice his opinion on it, but that City team were a shambles defensively yesterday. But their system was half decent, and they can keep the ball. With if you've got the system right, you can cover a lot of bad players. But yeah, our system just exposes every weakness we've got, and there is many. Our system exposes every one of them, whereas teams usually... Like, look, for me, John Terry's probably the best centre-back in the last 15 years. And he's one. Of, he's probably the slowest centre-back I've ever seen. But Chelsea managed that weakness, and they built the team, set a team around him. They defended deep. They had Makalele just covering in front of him. They had Carvalho semi-quick, but they never got high enough up to be able to him to get ran in behind anyway. They manage the weakness. With us, we don't do that at all. We don't look after any player's weakness. We just, oh, we're going to play. I think Terry, um, John Terry was a, was underestimated at just how good a footballer he was. And when you mention, you know, Manchester City keeping the ball, I think this is where you, you've you got to understand is where they were so much, why they were so much better and where they were so much better than us. Because, and if you're watching it, you noticed it yesterday, either of you watching the game, but we have this very deliberate 
pass it across, one touch to control the ball, pass it to the next. It, it's two touch football we play. We play, you know, back to uh, side to side, side to side. And every player, Kalazanac, one tap, pass it, one touch, passes it back to Socrates. Socrates, one touch, passes it over to Chambers. One touch, passes it over to Mainsley Niles. And, and we did that so slowly. When you watch Manchester City yesterday, they're so technically um, superior to us is that those are one-touch passes. When we had that little spell against West Ham the other day, we were quick, incisive, one-touch passing. And that was the difference. They can hold the ball, but they're good enough. They were just better than us. So when you're passing it into their midfield, and when those centre-backs are passing it out, they're all so comfortable in possession. And that second touch just enables a team to press us a little bit easier. And that single touch that they make enables them to bypass the press so quickly. We just have to face it's better. And going back to the question, who do we need to buy? I tend to agree with Liam. We we need a superstar central midfielder. We really do. We need a Cazorla back. We need a Fabregas back. We need a Wilshire at his best. Somebody who can take the ball left or right, can turn both ways, can play with both feet and doesn't give the ball away. And he's comfortable to, to carry the ball forward. Um, otherwise, we're we're in a lot of trouble. Let's go on. NBA Gunner. Um, wouldn't Pochettino... Um, be wanting to bring his own back staff in if he was brought in um, wouldn't this be a problem if Arsenal want to keep Freddie around as they want to groom him into the role well Tony I, th- I don't think the Pochettino thing's going to happen do you? No um, but in answer to the question Freddie wasn't in Emery's plans as backroom staff they they kind of created a second assistant manager for, for him or they was coaching and assistant manager so Emery's team was always him and Casado and a couple of others and then they added Emery on I mean sorry added Lundberg on I think that'll be the case with whoever comes in um, that they'll just have him there hanging around and, and helping um, but anyone who comes in is going to is going to want their own staff I mean I guess we're going to get onto the really strong rumours of Arteta today because Vinny was pictured coming out of his house at silly o'clock in the morning last yeah. night but I mean all the rumours it'll be him and Chabi Alonso and I would imagine Lundberg tagged onto that yeah, I mean, we'll get on. Let's we'll finish with the management discussion because obviously it's the it's the key thing that's happening in our club at the moment. We've got a caretaker manager, a club legend, and there's rumours all around of of who's going to replace him. So we'll finish with that debate. Um, this was also from MWA. Not many questioners, but MWA has uh, has filled his boots this week. We only faced 17 shots, which is nothing compared to what we were normally facing. That's an improvement, surely. Hey, some positivity. <laughs> We only got battered 3 0. <laughs> Liam, uh, uh, there wasn't really an improvement. They could have had 30 shots if they'd have wanted to. Isn't that fair? They just gave up. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what I thought when I saw the question. Um, you kind of have to see why they didn't take so many shots. And it's because they spent most of the second half passing the ball right, uh, run in their own half. They didn't need to do anything with it. They had no reason to go all out and take more shots. It's not like. Um, I forget who it was uh, before, but it's not like they were trying to get an equaliser or anything like like Watford away. They were trying to get an equaliser, so hence they're they're pushing on to us trying to find that equaliser. City didn't need to do that. They could just keep the ball. They're settled at 3-0 up, no danger. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Halls, to, to balance out that positivity from MAA, Halls of Marble comes in and says, relegation is a serious possibility for us. Are you prepared for Arsenal versus Watford, but in the championship and not in the Premier League. Tony, are we going to get relegated? No. 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 Uh, Halsey Marble says it's a serious possibility. Do you disagree? Uh, Yes. I mean, look, as long as it's mathematically possible, it's always a possibility. But I don't think it is. If it's a serious possibility, go and put money on it. Liam, you nervous? Well, we're just as many points off the top four as we are relegation. So if relegation is a serious possibility, why isn't top four? That's it. A little bit of positivity. I'm a bit scared. <laughs> it is just one of those seasons where if you look at our recent results, it's uh, it's relegation form. The only game we've won in 11, isn't it, is West Ham, who are also in free fall. Um, we've been beaten by all of our relegation rivals or, or haven't beaten any of our relegation rivals. And our next few games look kind of tough. So, um, Halls of Marble, of course, I'm not going to say we're going to get relegated, but I don't want to dismiss it so so easily. Now, this one's from Kernos. I keep getting let down by Mesut Ozil. 
We understand his limitations, but on the other hand, we can't do without what he provides going forward. De Bruyne's performance typifies why we can't afford to have him in the starting eleven. A luxury player. We need runners and energy over everything else. Tony? It's, it's a difficult one because I don't think Ozil was anywhere near as bad as people are making out yesterday. And I'm not saying he was anywhere near good. But when when he's out of the team, you're sort of calling for him to come back in. We can't pass the ball. We get people that can run forward and then do nothing with it or they don't they don't quite make it far forward enough. And it's, it's just an absolute mess. Look, in an ideal world, Ozil would have the legs of Gwendouzi or Smith Rowe and I think we'd all be happy, but he doesn't. And it's difficult to know what the answer really is. We, we've seen earlier in the season that we got the front, we had the front three, whoever it, whoever it was, isolated, and we just couldn't get the ball up there. I, 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 I don't know what the answer is, to be honest. Now, Liam, what's your, what, are you an Ozil fan, Liam? One of my favourite players, if I'm honest. I just love watching him play. Um, I agree with Tony. He wasn't anywhere near as bad as what social media would put him out to be. Um, but if you swapped Ozil and De Bruyne in this Arsenal and Man City side, De Bruyne would be looking as awful as everyone's making out Ozil to be. And Ozil would do different things to Kevin De Bruyne in that Man City side. They're two different. They have different ways of playing. So. It's a difficult comparison, if you ask me, and I don't think they do the same thing on either side. Well, I gave Ozil three points last week in my uh, my three two one in the West Ham game, and that was a little controversial. People didn't think he was that good, but I just enjoyed watching him play. But Tony, you and I have argued many times. I think he's a flat track bully, and uh, yesterday was everything I hate about Mesut Ozil. When you want somebody who's as who's as talented as him to to really stamp his mark on the game. All right, we're playing against somebody who's far superior, but he's our best player, he's our most expensive player, he's our wealthiest player, um, and he's he's just just doesn't show that inclination, any interest, any desire when it's that sort of game. Just just a, a waste of space. Yeah, look, I mean, as I said, if he's, I'd I'd hate the fact that money comes into it. It said he wasn't the worst player on the pitch. Giving him a big contract doesn't mean he's going to play better than he did the week before when he wasn't on a big contract. It's just, as I said, he gets looked at for that reason, and it's understandable. But for me, I, I, I just look at when they're on the pitch. I just look at the players that are on the pitch. I don't care what they earn. So Aubameyang was absolutely dog shit yesterday. Couldn't care less what he earns. He was shit. Guendouzi was terrible. Don't care what he earns. Don't care how old he is. I just judge the players that are on the pitch on what they do on the pitch, and and that's probably maybe why I'm a bit more lenient on Ozil than other people are at times. But, I mean, it's just, look, Xhaka's not there, so Ozil's going to get the blame for everything. And around me yesterday, it was ridiculous at times. There was one time, we tackled one of their players for once, and they, their guy went down, and it, uh, it wasn't a foul, but our players thought it might be, so they stopped. And literally, everyone stopped. Ozil was the only one that carried on running and called for the ball, and I think it was Torreira on the ball, ended up passing it backwards. No, no problem. But then someone behind me, oh, fucking Ozil again. And it's like, no matter what happens, he gets blamed. Uh, someone posted him earlier and his numbers yesterday were half decent as always and you can't judge football on numbers either but it, you just can't keep blaming him for everything and this nonsense about oh he didn't sprint off we're 3-0 down 3-0 was the best that result was ever going to get if it was up to me I'd have asked him to take longer to get off well I was going to bring that up I was going to bring that up uh, Liam uh, you know he's with the recent thing that happened with Xhaka we're losing a game you, you get substituted Ozil's name goes up. Um, uh, there wasn't the sarcastic applause that there was when, when this situation happened and developed with Jacker. But he did go off with that arrogant strut as if to say, you know, me, and, and walked off as slowly as he possibly could. Uh, were you happy with the way he went off the pitch? It didn't really bother me, in all honesty. Um the difference with Xhaka was we were chasing the game. I can't remember the exact scoreline. but So, yeah, we're trying to win the game. It, it's like Tony, it, Again, I'm agreeing with Tony in the sense that we're 3-0 down. What's really going to happen? The game state at the time, it's not like we were going at their throats trying to get the first goal back or anything like that. It was a completely dead contest. Ozil was frustrated. You could see that as soon as he got off the pitch as well. It, I, th- I saw it as frustration and more than anything else, if I'm honest. 
Well, I think he should have been uh, embarrassed that he's he's getting hauled off after an hour for one of our youngsters to come on because that's how ineffective he's been. Uh, and he should run off the pitch, put his head in, in his hands, put his hood over his head and, uh, and, uh, and show a bit of respect for this football club. That's what I think. I would have walked off slower, personally. Yeah, well, uh, I was I, I had a bet on us winning four three, so I wanted him to get <laughs> off quickly. Uh, this is from Romy. How much blame do you think Edu and Raul should get? Do you feel that they are making the best with the budget they are given? Club didn't really spend much in the summer. Pepe was in instalments and sold, uh, and we sold a lot of players. Um, Liam. Uh, you know, we, we, we talked at the start of the show about, or the start of the questions about, should KSE, should the Cronky family get the blame? Um, should it be the manager, or, or or is it down to this management structure we've got with Edu and Raúl? It's pretty difficult to tell with Edu because we still don't really know what he's about. He came in really late into the summer, and he didn't really have much impact on the on the transfers that we brought in, or at least I wouldn't imagine so. Raúl, on the other hand. At the time, we were saying he's done a fantastic job. That's great. Um, fantastic. Well done. We're now in the second period and we don't know the whys and wherefores as to where the, this manager situation is at the moment. We'll know more about that when the manager's actually appointed. I've said in the group chat before, let's actually see what happens first. and Because we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. There might be a perfectly reasonable explanation as to why we haven't got a manager in just yet. We, we don't know at the moment. We can only judge after it's happened and say, look, OK, well, you could have done that earlier or, all right, fair enough, I can see why it's taken this long, but it's the right decision. That's the only way we're going to be able to judge. Tony, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I think Liam's being too nice. For me, they're, they're, they've been incompetent in this phase. Like Even Lundberg saying that I've had no training sessions with them, well, that's why pretty much everyone was calling for the sacking in the international break, just like Tottenham done. Give the new manager sessions with the club when there's no games and he can do whatever he wants. Even even the players that are away on international duty would have came back on the Wednesday or Thursday, so you get the two sessions there. And then you've got the ones in between to kind of mould your ideas. It, and then not giving Lundberg staff after you throwing him under the bus, as I said earlier. I, I just think it has been completely incompetent from them to be honest go on I mean we, we where do you know you say not giving Lundberg any staff now if the decision is made this week uh, one way or the other if we if we see something this week then would you really give um, no I, I wouldn't have but then I wouldn't have left Lundberg in charge for what five games now it would be, it would be yeah, six but it's, it's you know they obviously didn't have a succession plan in place for the well, manager again, so they're that's, that's a criticism but, but that's a criticism yeah. not having a succession plan in place um, and yeah, I agree you know doing it in the international break would have been wise but because we didn't have one thing in place we couldn't do the other thing and that means that we can't now give Lundberg a staff if we're going to yeah. only have him for a few games but you're, you're backing up my point in a different way They've yes I am I'm, but that's what I'm saying he's been critical for the right reasons you know I mean it's it, they should have made the decision two weeks ago or they should have had uh, a succession planning but let's be realistic because it will go on to the next question or the last question which talks about our next manager is 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 there an ideal candidate out there and can you go after an Arteta and poach him from a from another club while your manager is still in in situ that sort of thing leaks into the press it's embarrassing you know uh, you could talk to the Allegri's um, and people that are out of work but the the, the people who are becoming favourites for the job Arteta you surely you can't approach I mean let's just move on because let's get into we'll get into the manager's um, uh, t- the management situation in a minute and this is from Samuel Babcock. Uh, does Saliba easily become our first choice centre back this summer? Who would you pair him up with from our current squad? Um, <laughs> we, we've already built Liam. We've already built Saliba up as the as the best player ever to play football. <laughs> uh, what do you see happening next year? Do you see Holding coming good? Do you see uh, Chambers improving, or do you think we need another centre back to pair with Saliba? Any number of things could happen, let's be honest. Um, we might even sign another one in January if the rumours are to be believed. Um, as for does he become our first choice centre back, I think he was going to be if he came this season anyway. So, yes, he probably does next season quite comfortably, more comfortably than we probably expected. As for who you're pairing with, I don't really know enough about him as a 
that's the type of centre back he is and his personality and his mindset. So I don't know whether you pair him with a, a Socrates who just does the basics defend. Yeah. Um tell me with, anything to add um on that? David Luiz is a bit more out there. Uh, anything to no, add I mean that? it looks like it he quite clearly comes in as a, a first team centre back. Who you pair him with, who knows? As I said the the system plays such a big part and until we know what we're going to be doing, you, you can't judge. We, we you don't know. You could get a manager who wants to play a back three. So it's hard to talk about a pairing when we ain't got a clue what we're doing. OK. Uh, Sammy also has a second part to that question. It's about should, um, if anyone would take him, uh, should Ozil, if anyone would take him and Lacazette, get sold to provide funds or do you want to keep them in their squad? I just keep that in mind because um, uh, let's move on. I... Uh, uh, I want to bring that, come back to that. But in um, Nigel writes, uh, and we'll finish with this question. Nigel from Arsenal Pods and Blogs: uh, Who do you want as the new manager? And don't say Pochettino; it's not realistic. Uh, Nigel feels it will be between Arteta and Ancelotti. So let's let, let's start this um, um, this debate on who's to be our next manager. And there aren't many candidates out there. Uh, Let's let's go through them. I mean, who's available? We, can we dismiss Ancelotti now? Ancelotti, is, do you think that's that's realistic, um, Tony? That he's going to join our football club? Uh, I think he would take it. Um, but, of course, he would. <laughs> he's yeah. just been sacked again. <laughs> but, but that's what's realistic. We don't know what. Look, for me, if they if it is going to be Arteta, they should have got it. They could have got it done a couple of weeks ago. I think it will be Arteta because I think that photo last night was staged. Like there's no, there's not a chance on hell the sun randomly have a photographer outside Arteta's house at one a.m. It just doesn't happen. No. And it was Arsenal was in the club vehicle as well, which is why the number plates blanked out. So you're not trying to hide it. So for me, it's going to be Arteta. I think he'll probably be appointed today, if not by midday tomorrow, uh, to try and give him again as many training sessions as possible before Everton. They probably won't have a day off this week. They usually have Wednesdays off, but they would have had today off. So then work, they'll work through the week and get as many training sessions in as possible. Um, so as that is my point of view, then I don't think anyone else is realistic because I think Arsenal put all their eggs in that basket. And for them to do so, you would hope that they've had a firm, solid answer rather than them putting all their eggs in a basket that they haven't got a clue what the answer is going to be. Liam, uh, who's in your shortlist? I did have Arteta in there. I wasn't really opposed to it post Fenger. Um, I would have liked Allegri. I don't think he was the most popular choice amongst everyone, but I like what he did at Juventus, and you can see they're not as good as they were under Sarri as they were under Allegri. Um, Ancelotti is probably in the frame, but I wouldn't pick him. I think it's, it seems to be, from what I've heard, that his methods are a bit outdated. I'd probably pick between Arteta and Allegri, and I'd probably sway towards Arteta, if I'm honest. Yeah. I mean, can we just put this, for me, put this Ancelotti one to bed? Ancelotti is one of those big names like Capello and, and, and Allegri and, uh, uh, oh, there's so many of them. I'm going to add Mourinho in there as well. What I call journeyman managers, Wenger, another good example. These managers who, who when a job comes up, they're always listed. They're always the ones out there. And, you know, would we have would we have Wenger back um, now? No, you know why would we then go for somebody of that era and that mould? Do you know Ancelotti has just been sacked, just been sacked because Napoli, when he was sacked, were seventeen points off the top. Their owners this year invested and wanted to challenge for the title this year. They expect to challenge for the title, and they are seventeen points off the top. And they are 11 points off the Champions League places uh, when he was sacked. Now, that's what Emery was doing at Arsenal. And Emery was sacked. So why would you replace him with somebody who's got that sort of record at the moment? So, you know, forget Ancelotti. I don't really get the Arteta thing. I never have. I am hoping, because I'm a big Arsenal fan, that Arteta turns out to be the thing that we're all you're all dreaming of. I just, I just don't see... Excuse me, that's my phone. I just don't see where we get it he's completely untried untested completely so just because he's worked under Wenger and he's worked under um, Pep Guardiola 
So have a lot of other <laughs> managers. Why is he suddenly so good, Tony? Why, why, why this clamour for Arteta? Uh, I'm not sure. I was reading the, the group chat earlier and people saying, oh, apparently he does all the tactics at sea. He absolutely doesn't. But like, even if he did, he doesn't. They've got pretty much the best assembled squad in or the most expensive assembled squad in the world. Their defensive shape is still horrendous, which, which worries me more than anything else. Is that, he, OK, he might get some pass the ball nicely, but if every time a team attacks, they score, we're going to be in trouble still. I... I I said this a few weeks ago, and I'm not sure if it was you who was on or if it was Tez, that everyone who's ever worked with him always said he was going to be a manager. Even when he was still playing, they said he's definitely going to be a manager one day. The, all the teams are linked with him are places he's been before. So maybe they've just seen things and they, they know or they can see the quality and they know what's there. It is difficult looking from the outside, but you always look when he, there's, he's always linked with Rangers. He was linked with the Everton job. He's been linked with us. City speak very highly of him. Obviously, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors and how much he does. Um, it was rumoured before that he was responsible for a lot of the video, video analysis. And uh, De Bruyne saw a quote today from an interview he'd done after the game where he said, oh, we knew exactly how Arsenal would press, that the front three would do this. And then there was not much beyond that. And if that is all based off video and that, he said we saw it on the videos. If that is based on what Arteta has researched, does that make you the prime candidate to be a manager or a head coach? Probably not, but it's a damn sight more than we're getting at the moment. I'm not really sure where I sit with him being manager if I'm the head coach, if I'm delighted or distraught about it, but I guess time will tell. Um, Liam, maybe you can tell me, why are people so excited about Mikel Arteta? Not a club legend, played for us for a few years, captained us for a few years, never stood out in my history of Arsenal, um, captured us through a relatively unsuccessful period of our history. Uh, so he's, he, he doesn't command that legend status uh, um, that a Vieira would. Um, sell me sell me Mikel Arteta. I'm not sure I can because I think it's more hope than his expectation. We've looked at the likes of Nagelsmann when he came through at Hoffenheim. Uh, I've seen Ten Hag um, at Utrecht. I've seen Mark Rose, I think, has been mentioned as well. And we're all hoping that Arteta can and will be the same thing, especially when we're seeing what he said about his philosophy on the Arsenal website several years ago. I think it is more hope more than it is expectation. But I think it's also one fans can get behind a bit more because he has played for us and we can relate to him in more than we can most other candidates. Yeah, it's, it's very underwhelming, isn't it? It's a very underwhelming situation we're finding ourselves in where we're all pinning our hopes on an untried manager. And let's just say, if he is responsible, and like Tony, I disagree completely, uh, he is responsible for the tactics at Manchester City. But let's say that Pep Guardiola does just sit there with his feet up and let Arteta take control of everything. Then this is Manchester City's worst performance in the league for years they've got the the best talent in the premier league and yet they're miles away from winning the title this year you know so so where where's the success you know where where is this success coming from i i, I think making an appointment now a snap appointment at this time of the year when the right candidate is not out there could be an absolute disaster this football club and put us back 18 months because you're not going to just give a uh, uh, and I'll touch it probably till the end of the season. You're probably have to going to sign him Great. on a two and a half year contract. Uh, yeah. And if it doesn't work this year, then we, we've lost another six months and, and we just go backwards. Tony, you wanted to come in there? Oh, I'd just say, I was saying it'll be a three and a half minimum, uh, I'd guess. Yeah, I just don't see it. Do you know, can I, can I put forward something else for you to shoot down? Um, uh, especially Tony, because I know your views really well on this. For me, uh, and it goes back to the question, that the, the Samuel Babcock question about should we sell uh, Lacazette and should we sell Urzel if we, if we can get anyone to take him to fund uh, Arsenal. I think we're in a really clear situation. I've been watching this club for a long time and I'm watching that game yesterday showed that we have dropped down a level completely. You know, we're not challenging with for the title. We're not even really realistically looking like we're going to get top four this year. I mean, that's fair comment, I think. I don't think I'm saying anything outrageous. We've had questions in about relegation. So I think that shows where we are as a club. And we've got players within the club 
that aren't performing or don't want to perform. You've talked about Aubameyang's lack of interest. You talk about Ozil's uh, attitude when he walks off. We know that Granit Xhaka um, is, has fallen out with a club and that's not going to fix itself. We know that there's rumours in the press that Torreira wants to leave. Um, we've brought in players, David Luiz, who has just not worked for us. So do we not, as Arsenal fans now, have to really look at our club and say, right, we've made a mistake. These players don't have the right mentality. Uh, there's no real coach out there. So we have to start from scratch and almost look over the road at what Chelsea have done and look at that team that finished yesterday and look at where the core of our next generation is going to come from. We've got a very good young goalkeeper. There's very little in defence apart from the potential of holding um, to look forward to. Tierney, Bellerin, Genduzi, Trevor and Jack are going to go and Aubameyang and Lacazette are, are coming up to two years left in their contracts. So this season, if they don't want to join us, they're going to have to go. One year, so, not two. So aren't we going to look at this year that Lacazette's going to have to be sold, Aubameyang's going to have to be sold, let's sell Torreira if he does want to play for the club, we have to sell Xhaka because there's no future for him at the club, and then we're going to, going to be left with the front line of Saka, Nelson, Pepe, Martinelli, uh, and Katia. These, that, that's where we are. And with the 150, 200 million that we should raise from selling those players, that maybe will give us a chance to reinvest. And for yeah. me, it's only gone, gone, Tom. No, I, to be honest, I, I, I pretty much agree with you. And I think in terms of if it is to be Arteta, it'll be a blessing in disguise because he'll get to to bring in his own players with what he wants. It's not I'm not doubting the ability of these players, but especially with their ages, a lot of them as well, they the, the project's coming to an end. If it hasn't finished already, it is, it's nearing the completion. So you start a new phase and a new project. I'm, I don't think it will be all of them players you've listed. I think you get the money in and you rebuild in the areas you need to rebuild. And it, I don't think we'll ever see regularly a front three of Martinelli, Saka and Pepe or Nelson. But if you've got 200 million worth of sales plus a, a normal transfer window of, say, 100 million that we've just generated anyway then you can go and buy. If you think our oh, Saka's maybe not good enough, you go and buy a left winger. Or if this player in at right back or whoever, you can you can go and invest. But as I said, I think this project's coming to an end if it's not finished already. And a lot of them players, are, I, I would ship out. And it's not because I don't like them. And you said two years left with Aubameyang and Lacazette. It's one at the end of the season. Um, that was another thing that I, I, I pointed out at the time that Raul's first, and Vinny's first interview where everyone gave him a load of praise, an hour-long interview, sort of unseen before from our club. If anyone gets in the last two years and doesn't sign, we're going to, have to, we're going to get rid of them to protect the value and protect the asset. Well, their first window in charge, they've ignored that with two of our biggest players. Well, three if you include Ozil, but obviously we know the situation there. That They've just ignored that everything that they gave a press briefing about a month before. I didn't realise it was one year. I'm blown away by that. I thought it was two years because that's no. They're all, they're all 2021. Wow. Well, um, Liam, anything to add on my uh, my what I reckon should happen at the club? Not really. If, if I'm honest, I can only agree with you. Um, the only difficulty might be is who's going to take these players on if they're seeing they're not trying. Do they want them at their clubs? You know, Megan and Bamian, who's just got that talent, is a bit easier to ship off. But and also. He's going to demand a lot of money and he's just blown uh, any chances of him moving to China by all accounts. So who's going to pay him the wages? Who's going to want to get these players as well? That's half the difficulty. Well, I mean, o Ozil sees that his contract. That's why I just said we know the situation there because of, of what you just mentioned. Just forget any idea of selling him. It's not happening. But the uh, the others, that's why I said three of our biggest players, if you include Ozil, but you can't really because they're not going to offer him a new deal. And no one's going to sign him. But the other two, you've got to sell them this summer for me. Unless unless they commit. Look, if Aubameyang comes in tomorrow and says, I want to sign a new contract, I wouldn't get rid of him. But I just don't think either of them want to sign a new contract, to be honest. I mean, that's it, Tony, is that we've, we've got to face this. I'm looking at this from two angles. One is that, you know, we have reached this low stage because, because of these players, because of their, you know, their, their desire. The fact that Aubameyang and Lacazette do not, are not breaking the door down to sign a new contract from Arsenal. It's a bit of a nasty place to be, Arsenal, at the moment. And I think they'll be happy to go and play the last few years of their career somewhere else. So we should be proactive in that now. 
now you know this this transfer window if it needs to be certainly in the summer and if these players let's let's look at i mean i i, I know i'll get criticism for this if it was me today, I'd appoint Lundberg till the end of the year because I don't see there is anything we can lose. He has been brought up with these under-23 players and our target for the for the rest of the season will should be to avoid relegation, try and win the Europa League and try to put something together and leave some of these players who don't want to be at our football club on the sidelines. Let them rot, sell them in the summer. Sell them in January if we can. I think this is an ideal opportunity. We said that the... The, the players don't have any time uh, to train the players. Bringing in a manager now when there isn't a, a, the right choice out there for us, when he's not going to have any time to, to work with these players because it's two games a week. What is that going to do? How is that going to help? Unless there's a real strong character out there that can really change the mindset of these players. And maybe that is Arteta. But for me, I saw how Freddie ended that game yesterday. He ended that game with Saka playing, with Willock playing. You know, it was a, with, with Pepe one side. It was a young side a young side full of his players, uh, Emil Smith-Rowe. And I think that's what we should do this season. Uh, I, I disagree. But... I know you do. Yeah, of course, <laughs> isn't it? I just don't see the point in getting in, in. I mean, I really hope Arteta works out. But I just don't see where, uh, you know, this is Arsenal Football Club. Let's wait. Let's give Freddie till the end of the year. Make the appointment in the summer when there's a lot more, um, you know, when somebody can come in with a pre-season, where we, somebody can come in and we can sell some players and buy some new ones. What is the point of doing it now? I, mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Arteta coming in now is, or if it is Arteta, is a, a six month of get your system ready. And then in the summer, we'll have the mass clear out and you can sign the players that, that fit your system. I, I think... The six months, I, I, can't, I agree with you that this six months is a write-off. It's just a learning phase. But I think they're doing that with the idea that you get your system implemented for the players that you want to keep and then you get rid of the players that, that don't fit that. Mm. I just don't see where the... I just don't see where Arteta... Where any, I don't, just don't see, you know, for the fact that some players have said, yeah, he'll be a manager one day. <laughs> you know, is, that, is that really how we're going to appoint the next Arsenal manager? Somebody who's never played before, never managed before at any level, and he's going to be our next manager. Liam, any thinking? To add? The only thing I'm thinking is, uh, and I wanted to ask you actually, if we do go to the summer, do you see anybody that's going to want to come to us as well? Who do we think we can get in the summer? Well, we're Arsenal Football Club, and at least at the end, you know, as a prospect now for any manager, and, and now I'm not going to say this one is going to happen, but let's just say Brendan Rodgers, who would love to manage a big club like Arsenal, because that matches his ego, at the moment is managing Leicester City. Now, I say I'm not specifically talking about Brendan Rodgers, but just think about him uh, in place of any of the top managers out there. He is now mid-season doing well, which is why he's marketable. Um, if he now leaves uh, Leicester City and joins Arsenal in December, all right, he's managing a big club, but this season is written off. And somebody with a, as ego as big as Brendan Rodgers, and let's think that most of the good managers have great big egos, he is going to join Arsenal. He won't get the credit for what Leicester are doing this year because he'll have left in December, and he'll be finishing mid-table with Arsenal uh, and won't get any credit for that. Actually, it's a pretty awful season. Uh, if, but however, if in May that job offer comes up, and he's just finished runners-up with Leicester, then someone like Brendan Rodgers may look at that opportunity to manage a big club, to spend a couple of hundred million in the transfer window, and, and to do it. Now those managers aren't available, but in May there's a chance to talk to them. And I just think that by jumping in like uh, Manchester United did with Solskjaer, um, you know, giving him the, the contract before, before waiting till the end of the season... Look how they've suffered. They have lost, um, you know, they've lost half of a year again. And that's where I see us doing the same. Let's just point Freddie till the end of the season and not give him a credit. No matter, no matter how well he does, sit down in the summer and see who's available to manage. Because this is such an important um, appointment for us. If we get this one wrong, then how long will it be to repair it? Another 18 months goes down the drain? Not in the Champions League for another two seasons? Three seasons? Financially, then we're 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 just a mid-table side. Yeah, I guess it's a bit of a risk versus reward scenario because I don't really see in the summer. If we get to the summer and we did appoint Freddie Jumberg, 
I wouldn't be surprised if Arteta was again amongst the names. And if we think that's who we might appoint in the summer, we might as well do it now. Because if we go for, I mean, you look at Eric Ten Hag from Ajax at the moment, he's probably nailed on for the Bayern Munich job in the summer. You look at Real Madrid, will Zidane stay there? Well, if not, then Pochettino is probably the first choice over at Real Madrid. I don't really see many options out there because I don't no, no, see Niall Gusman leaving. But follow what you're follow logically what you're saying. If he goes, then there's a, a, a big manager, managerial merry-go-round starts, and people become available. Do you know there's you know, Pochettino at the moment too close to Tottenham, too close to all of that. By the summer. He might have rethought his his options. The PSG job, which he thinks he might get, might have, have gone. Uh, and suddenly he becomes available. What I'm saying is, is now you've got all of the people who have been sacked. They're the only ones available. Or we're talking about Arteta, who's got no experience whatsoever. Is it really the right time to make the decision? Tone? As I said, I, I think long term it is because you start next season with a team that are already used to a system. And the, as I said, I, I think the next six months are a write off. We might scrape the Europa League if we if we get a team playing. Um, but I think going into next season ready. I mean, look at and this is nothing against Emery, although I didn't like him. The first few weeks under him were a mess. We were pressing one week. We were really high up the next. We were Then we were dropping on the edge of our own area. We were attacking quite well, but it was sort of all over the place and disjointed. I think you use now as a bedding-in period. The same as you say with players that they took four months to get used to the league and whatnot. Now you get everyone used to, if it is to be Arteta's system, how he wants you to play. You then assign the players that exactly fit that system. It's very, I mean, you mentioned Bred- Brendan Rodgers, an interesting one, because it's exactly what Leicester done. Albeit that he had experience and Arteta doesn't, but they bring Rogers in. They got him the system he wanted. He then signed the players that he knew would fit that system, bombed off the players that wouldn't, regardless of how good or how much value they had. And now they're they're absolutely flying, or for, in terms of what you expect from Leicester. Yeah, I know, but he had just won the league three years running in Scotland, and he had managed to Liverpool to second place. No, you know, I, he, he had I, I, history. As I said it's a different level of experience, but it's the same idea that they're going with that you get the six months to just go by and let the season end how it's going to ha- going to end. But, but when the summer comes, you know exactly what you need, what you want, what players can do what and what they can't. Whereas if you get a new manager coming in the summer, they're not sure on players. So they have to give them, they keep them there for a few months to give them to see what they can do. And then they realise they don't want them. And then it's a big reshuffle the year after, which is exactly what Emery went through. Another big reshuffle this summer, got rid of a load of players. And we'd all agree rightly, not criticising him. But then three months later, we decide we don't want him anymore. And the process starts again. I, I think now is a good time to do it. Okay. Um, well, apart from not a good time. I thought three weeks ago was a good time. But Okay, I'll ask you both one. Uh, 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 both, I'm going to ask you both two questions. One, one word answers, please. Uh, so, uh, Liam, if you had to say which area of our team needs the most work, defence, midfield or attack? Um, defence, just. Tony? Uh, defence. OK. Manchester City, would you say they are uh, weakest in their defence, midfield or attack? Defence. <laughs> I'm asking you questions with obvious answers because that's yeah, the man they're, you're they're trying to bring. <laughs> they're loaded questions because they're defensive. Of course defensive. they're loaded, but they're obvious questions. They're obvious. Yeah, but they, they, their defence is better because they they don't give away the ball, which is a, a, a byproduct of their midfield and their attack. In the modern game, I don't really see that there's three different sections. Like Our midfield's an issue because they can't attack nor defend. Yeah. Our, our attack, we've moaned about earlier that Pepe and Aubameyang didn't press properly for the goal. So we say attackers, but their defensive side of the game is absolutely shocking. Our defence is a problem because our fullbacks can't attack at the moment and we can't defend either. Defenders have got both sides of the game wrong. I'd argue our midfield has got both sides of the game wrong and our attackers can attack but can't defend. So it, I know, look, you're loading the question to, to, to suit your point. But of course I am. The, the, system, the whole system, like the weakest area for me is the system which comes from the manager or the coach. It's not one specific defence midfield attack and it is easy to say defence because we concede so many goals. 
I just see that Freddie's got as much experience as Arteta. That's all. I just don't see the the uh, the improvement. Anyway, let's move on. We, we've all got our own opinions. Uh, uh, we've heard the draw as you mentioned earlier. Olympiacos in the Europa League uh, away first. That's got to be up there with the best draw possible because we should be able to beat them, and it's not that far to travel. Is that a fair comment, Liam? Yeah, I'd say so. It's probably not. I mean, they, I think they dropped down from the Champions League, didn't they? I'm yeah. not sure how they fared in their Champions League group. And Tottenham and Bayern, they drew with Tottenham away. They were 2 0 up against Tottenham at home, and then Tottenham took Eric Dyer off and 1 4 2. Okay. So potentially a bit of a banana skin fixture, but we should be able to come through it. Yeah, I mean, look, with the amount of good teams that are left in the competition, I know we couldn't face a lot of those in this round, but uh, for me, it was all about travelling. There was a lot of Eastern European, a lot of. Uh, a long distance travel and we've we've avoided that fair fair comment tony yeah i think it was one because of the seeding i think it was one of the harder games we could have got to be honest they're never in a push over at, at home it's hostile and our team are a bit gutless as we say quite often um travel was it four hour flight to greece it's, it's not the end of the world and to be honest it could be the only competition we're in come february so it might not be the worst thing in the world but i think in terms of just the actual team and the game Considering the seeding, I think it was one of the harder draws we could have got. Uh, next up, we're at uh, Everton. Um, you both seem to think we'll have a new manager in charge there. Um, he, here's one. Sorry, I didn't want to go back to Arteta, but I did write this down while you were talking earlier, Tony. Um, why is Arteta being more closely linked with Everton, where he is a legend at the club? Um, he, he was initially. Um, I think Ferguson's... Look, if, if Lundberg had come in and done what Ferguson's done, he would have got the job. He hasn't. And that's not, that's not, I'm not blaming him because, as I said, I think he's been set up to fail. But I think all of the Everton, you cut the first few days, everyone was linked with Everton, as much so as they was with us. But, but Everton are a smaller club than us. Uh, shouldn't they be looking at one of their past legends? You know, isn't, isn't they that, They've isn't, got a guy in there who's doing that. Yeah, I mean, but uh, so you think they'll uh, they'll put Ferguson? If they beat us on, on Saturday, he gets a job. Okay, he's been uh, number two there for ten, twelve, fourteen years. I don't know. I know he's been in and about. I don't know if he's been officially the number two. Or well, just you know, he's been in the backroom staff in non-stop since he's since he stopped playing for them. I think you know uh, I, I, he is your caretaker manager, isn't he? He's somebody who knows the club really well, who's uh, who's not being groomed like Freddie was to be our next manager. He's just somebody who's who loves the club. Um, I just thought that Arteta, club legend, their captain, uh, you know, loved there, idolised. You know, well, they also, seems... I mean, they they were disgusted with him for leaving the way he left for us as well. So I don't know how their fans would view that either. But as I said, he was being linked with them, and I think if Ken Wright had his way, it would be Moyes and then Arteta as his second choice. But um, what's the guy what's the owner of his ass? what's his name Moshiri uh, Mashiri he um, he wanted a continental name um, but I think as I said I think if they beat us on Saturday which I think the smart money is probably is what they'll do uh, I think Ferguson gets a job I mean his three games would have been Chelsea home United away and us home and if he gets seven points out of that and I think long term it'll be the wrong choice I think it'll be a Solskjaer thing but I think after them three games you can't Especially, I think they were 17th when they appointed him. Or well, not appointed him, when he took over. So I, I just think long-term, you can't um, ignore that. Long-term, it won't be good, but short-term, you can't ignore that. And I think they'll give him at least at the end of the season, if not longer. So, Liam, we were away at Everton uh, at the weekend. Terrible time to play them. We're there right in the middle of their new manager bounce. Uh, and watching their game uh, against, uh, was it Manchester United yesterday and their, their first game in yeah. charge, uh, where they just... They seem to have taken Duncan Ferguson literally and just kicking their way uh, into some results. Isn't that the worst team we could possibly face at the weekend? Quite probably, but you don't know how much as well that the uh, Man United equalised quite late and sort of that might knock their confidence a bit. Maybe I'm clinging on to hope more than anything. We might get a new manager bounce if uh, a manager does come in this week or as soon as possible. I think it's a tight one to call. Um, Obviously, hope we go there and win, but we've always struggled away at Everton, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be up there, Tony. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are they still in the uh, Carabao Cup? Or did they go out? I think so. Yeah. 
Oh, so they've got a game midweek as well, and we don't know how if they are still in it. So we don't know how hard they'll they'll look at that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I am going up. It's interesting. Freddie's record so far is draw, lost, one, draw, lost. Will he continue that? Will he not be in charge? Who knows? <laughs> They're at home to Leicester in the next round as well, so that's not exactly an easy game. Well, that's, it'll be tomorrow or Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. Okay, so so and that, does that mean that Freddie's got all week to work on something for a change? No, well, that's why I think they they appoint a manager by the end of today, if not midday tomorrow, because the players are off today anyway, and then they've got four solid sessions because I don't think they'll have Wednesday off. They'll have four sessions with a new manager to try and implement some idea. I said, I feel sorry for Freddie because even if you give him four sessions with him and one other coach who is still doing another job as well, how much can you really implement? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not an ideal situation. That's why I think they should make the decision now and give it to Freddie till the end of the season. Let but then they still have to if they've not if they've not uh, been telling him to ready a backroom staff, which we don't know, but I, I don't think they have, is my opinion. Then you still have the same thing that if they appoint him, he still has to go out and get his staff, and if he doesn't do that this week, which would be an unfair ask for him to expect to just have him like at the t- on the tip of his tongue, then it's going to be in the same situation for this week. And you've wasted, not, I mean, one of the most important weeks we've had in a long time. Um, whereas I, I assume that, especially speaking to Arteta last night, I, I think he knows he's got the job. And it would have been, I don't know where these Chavi Alonso rumours have come from, but there's always been, whenever he's linked with a job, it's always linked that Chavi Alonso would be his number two. And you'd assume he'd have his team half ready. I wouldn't be surprised, as I said, if it is Arteta by today or tomorrow, that it's all announced at once. That yeah, and, and Arteta, his backroom staff is Lundberg plus Javi Alonso plus 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 plus, and it will all be all done in one. Well, when you say plus 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 plus, you know, I, I don't see that. You know, he's full time employed by Manchester City. I don't suppose he's. You know, I'm sure that Freddie's got his backroom staff in his mind as much as Arteta has. It's just where they can go out and employ them. You know. Surely, surely, Freddie for the last three weeks has been saying, well, if they give me the job, he's been talking to his guys that he's going to put in place. You know, why wouldn't he? It, it, it depends what they've told him. Besides, if they've told him you're only a caretaker manager, then probably not. It I depends. Think, I mean, in an and, ideal world, he'd, he'd, they'd have appointed him as a caretaker. He'd have won these five games and uh, it would have been less appointed through the end of the season. Problem done. You know, it's... Uh, it hasn't worked out that way. Anyway, look, um, are we, we're, we're creeping on in time again. Uh, it seems like it was a long time ago since we talked about the match. Anything else you guys want to add that we haven't covered? Or do you think we're done? Uh, I'm good. Can't think of anything. Well, <laughs> we're an hour shorter than we were when me and Tony just argued after a win last week. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's good. We, uh, we're, we're, we're in free fall. <laughs> we've got no manager uh, We our players don't seem to care half of our fans left the stadium at half time it's all rosy in the Arsenal garden thank you very much for joining us today Tony thanks for having me and, uh, and Liam well done on your debut uh, thank you very much a pleasure and uh, we will talk to you all after the Everton game next week thanks very much <laughs> Thank you.